When we start thinking about going on a family vacation, my family gets very concerned because their immediate thought is, how can we get there the quickest? Let's just fly wherever we're going, take the most direct route. And they know that my mind immediately starts going to Google Maps and saying, well, what are the different ways we can get there and get back? And I don't like to go someplace and then come back the same way. I want to see different things. I want to do different things. There are a tremendous amount of ways to get to the same location, and I want to explore all of them. And they're a little worn out on that. But, you know, the same thing is true really in uh, communication. There are so many words that we can choose from. There's so many ways that we can communicate the same idea or the single idea. Uh, English is a vibrant language and constantly growing and changing in the amount of words that we have and the ways that we can use them. And that doesn't even factor in all the different nonverbal expressions that we have and all the different other other different channels of, of communication that we have access to. So when we're thinking about how best to communicate an idea or how we should communicate something we have lots of different options right lots of different paths and roads that can take us to this uh, same general area the same sort of destination uh, so really it becomes a matter of personal choice and and which way we're going to go and in a certain sense though we we need to be very cognizant of the power that comes with that um, that in communication with those different choices. And, and in some ways it can feel like this kind of battle between good and evil, right? Um, the, 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 we have these forces within us. Are we going to do this the way that we know we should and the way that, that um, best serves our purpose, but also best serves our integrity and, and maintains our ethics? Or are we going to do it in maybe a little different route? We're going to take uh, go to the dark side or we're going to, you know, uh, that type of thing, uh, which leads us into our conversation today on ethical communication. What does it mean to be an ethical communicator? What are the principles that we need to consider just in general as communicators when it comes to ethics, but then also in particular as people of faith, as Christians, what does that mean for us when we talk about ethical communication and, and how does our, our Christian faith um, factor into that as well? So let's start by looking at just some of the general principles of ethical communication, just as any communicator should, should be cognizant of these, these ethical principles as a communicator to make sure that we're not veering into the, you know, over to the dark side or whatever. We want to make sure that we're maintaining uh, solid ethics as communicators because there is great power here, right? And with Spider-Man told us not to mix metaphors and cross genres here, but Spider-Man's uncle Ben actually told us with great power comes great responsibility. So we need to yield our words responsibly and ethically. So some of the ways that we do that first are by being truthful and honest. I mean, there's not a whole lot to add to that, right? I mean, we should be truthful. We should be honest with people and, uh, and be able to, to maintain ethical communication in that way. So that what we're saying is again, the truth and is honest for that situation. And, and uh, so we just need to, to be truthful and honest and it keeps things much simpler that way anyway. We need to practice active listening. If we're going to be an ethical communicator, we're going to, we're going to need to listen well because at the end, somebody may say, do you understand? Or you, you, you know what I'm saying? Or whatever. We ought to legitimately be able to say, yes, I understand. Or no, I don't understand. Or, uh, instead of just kind of pseudo listening and, and nodding our head and yep, yep, I got it. No problem. And then we're not really hearing what they're saying, not listening actively to what they're saying. Ethical communication requires us to practice active listening and to be actively involved and engaged in that conversation. We also need to avoid judgment. Again, that's not a permanent thing. I mean, you know, as humans, we're going to, to judge. We're going to have an opinion and things. But while we're listening, we ought to be able to separate those things and, and, and keep an open mind on different things and, and avoid judgment, um, first of all, unless it's asked for. And secondly, unless we feel it's absolutely necessary after we've you know, received all the information, we have all the facts, we've done our research, we know what we're talking about, um, then we can maybe start to think about um, some sort of judgment, but, you know, to a certain extent, um, judging whether something is right or wrong or good or bad for us and those types of things. But but up to that point, we ought to avoid judgment. And we certainly shouldn't be judging people on the basis of their choices, their decisions, and what they feel is right for them. Um, you know, life is about personal choices and about personal responsibility for those choices. Um, so we need to avoid judgment in order to be ethical communicators. We also need to speak from our own experience. Uh, 
you know, we don't want to get into this hearsay thing. Well, this happened to this person, so that must be true. Or I've read this on the internet or saw it on TV. We certainly can't rely on that necessarily, right? So we need to speak from our own experience. We need to be confident that the information that we're giving and, and we're providing is, is accurate because we've lived it, because we've experienced it, because we know it to be true. So we ought to speak from our own experience. And, and if we're not, then we ought to indicate that and say, well, you know, I read somewhere maybe and, and qualify it with that instead of saying, well, this is absolutely true. And I know it because it happened to me or because I lived it. We need to speak from our own experience as ethical speakers. We need to consider the receiver's preferred channel. We need to consider whether this person, you know, prefers to uh, read text. I, I don't text my dad because he doesn't really text. So I know that, uh, that to communicate with him, uh, especially about something important. If I send a text, he's not going to read it. He's not going to see it. He's not going to use that information. Uh, that's not his preferred method, right? but our kids, they prefer text. They don't want, necessarily want to call. They accept a call from us occasionally. It's all right. They like to talk to us about certain things and they'll, they'll accept one, you know, every week or two from us. They'll allow that, so to speak, but, uh, but they prefer just a text, a, a quick text. They're, 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 they're uh, natives of this digital world. And so, they much prefer text to a phone call. They certainly prefer a text to an email or something like that. Um, and they only accept a text from me because I'm not even on social media. I don't, so I can't send a messages through those channels. So, but you ought to consider the, the receiver's preferred channel when we're communicating with them. A few others uh, for just general ethics in communication. We ought to strive to understand. Um, notice this doesn't say we ought to strive to agree or strive to affirm or strive to um, justify or, you know, those types of things, but we ought to strive to understand where somebody's coming from, why they would say that, why they would do that. Um, what, you know, it ought to be our purpose to try and put ourselves in those shoes, demonstrate some empathy and understand the reasoning behind this before, again, we start getting into things like analysis and judgment and evaluation. We ought to first strive to understand and, and make that our purpose and our goal in any conversation. We got to stay positive. Uh, you know, even if we're delivering bad news or if we're, we're in a conversation that's uncomfortable, those things happen. Those conversations need to happen and they are important. I'm not saying that we should avoid difficult topics or difficult things, but we ought to stay positive about these things. You know, again, English is a wonderful language and we have the ability to um, frame things in a positive way, even that aren't as pleasant. Uh, and recently my parents are, are getting older. They're in their eighties. And, and so they've started making arrangements and for their, for their, for their death, for, you know, when they're called home. And, uh, those are conversations that they've had with us and they've with my siblings and I and, and our families. And, and in terms of, in, in a practical sense, first of all, uh, since I was a child, I know my parents have always been very clear about, you know, Hey, nobody lives forever. You know, grandparents die, people die, we're going to die someday. It's not pleasant in that moment, but we can be reassured as again, as people of faith, we can be reassured that we're going to be reunited someday and, and, and moreover, we're going to be uh, reunited while we're in the presence of God. Right. So, I mean, it's not a fun conversation to have, but it's one that they've framed in a positive way, in a positive light. And the same with making their arrangements. They've been very straightforward saying to us, here's where our, you know, we've made arrangements through this uh, funeral service and this, you know, this, this home and this funeral service. And this is, we've communicated our wishes to them. We've written it down here. Here's what we want to happen. And here's our preferences. And, and how do you feel about these things? And, and it's all been very positive though. It's, it's very positive and framed in the sense of, we don't want you guys to have to worry about this and uh, we don't want it to be a burden on you. And it's not really, you know, it'll be sad. We're leaving you, but again, the stressing all the time. This is just a temporary, you know, first of all, this is a temporary body for us, temporary situation for us. Our real home is, is where we're going and we're going to be together again there. And we're going to be, you know, enjoying the presence of, of God. And, and so we just have that, that faith. And so all these conversations while difficult have still been very positive. We've always tried to do that with our kids when, when they've done something that we have concerns over, they've been in trouble or whatever, we've tried to frame it in a positive way. It's not that we haven't disciplined them. We have probably more than they would like, certainly on the harder end of some of our, their, their classmates, who seems never were really in trouble or disciplined for what they did, but you know, we would ground our kids. We would uh, take things away, we'd, you know, take away their driving privileges, take away their phone. Oh my goodness. Can you imagine? Right. 
but always trying to frame it in the sense of, look, we're doing this for your good. We want this to be a lesson for you because we want you to be safe. We want you to, you know, we're trying to frame things in a positive way, even difficult conversations. So as an ethical communicator, we can communicate difficult topics and, 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 you know, even sad things, but we can stay positive at the same time. Don't interrupt. Don't interrupt. It's a, it's a very simple principle, but it's very hard to do, right? When we interrupt, it conveys a sense of a lack of value for that other person and what they have to say. It says that what you are saying is not as important as anything that I have to say right now. So I'm just going to jump in here and cut you off. When we interrupt, it demonstrates not only that we're not listening, but that we're not really caring what that person is talking about. So ethical communicators don't interrupt unless it's an absolute necessity. You know, when you're talking to somebody and, and they're talking about something and you say, Oh my goodness, you're on fire. Okay. That's a, that's a fair interruption. Right. But, but, uh, but other than that, we will have our time and we shouldn't be spending our time just thinking about what we want to say. We should be actively engaged in the listening process, but even more over, we should not interrupt somebody else when they're speaking. It's not ethical. We should respect privacy and confidentiality. When somebody tells us something and, and they ask us to keep it to ourselves, guess what? We should keep it to ourselves. Or if they ask us not to say where we got some information or not to tell, you know, uh, somebody that, that, who said this, then we ought to respect that as well. Um, and hopefully we'll have an opportunity up front for them to say, look, I want to tell you something. We can say, look, if this is, you know, I'm not, I'm not about privacy or comment, you know, I don't want to have to keep this private or confidential. And so please, if it's something like that, please don't tell me. Uh, I, you know, I'd rather not get into that area or something. If you have a reason to do something like that, then state so up front. But when somebody tells you something in, in, you know, with confidentiality and expecting privacy, then we ought to respect that. And we ought to accept responsibility as communicators for what we say and the reactions that we have, the emotions that we express, all of it. Uh, when we communicate, it's on us and we ought to re accept responsibility for those things and, and those statements and things. Uh, we can also ex express regret and say, I'm sorry. I said that I, I should not have said that. Um, it was not my intention to hurt you or I didn't realize that that was something that was going to hurt your feelings. And I should have uh, understood that maybe a little better, but uh, we can say all those things and that's wonderful. That's great. Uh, but at the same time, we can't say, well, I, you know, that's, it's not my fault, but it is your fault. I mean, it is your responsibility to accept, you know, the consequences for what you say and the way that you behave. So as ethical communicators, when we say something, we ought to be able to and willing to, to say, yes, that's what I said. And either I stand by it or I regret it, or I take, you know, wish I could take it back or whatever. But either way, we need to use I statements and saying, I, I said that. It's my, my responsibility and, uh, and I accept responsibility for that. Um, but, and then we can continue on with that, not necessarily trying to weasel a lot of things, but, um, but that's, that's a major issue with things right now with, with communication. And since we, nobody wants to accept responsibility for things that they've said because they find them regrettable. So they would rather pass them along to somebody else or pass it off as though they didn't. We need to, to stand up and say, yes, that was me. For better or for worse, that was that was me, and that's what I said, and we ought to accept responsibility for that. So these are just principles that uh, that really apply to any communicator in any sense, right, of ethical communication. But there are some additional layers to things when we start thinking about how our faith factors into communication and and uh, and how that affects uh, our our ethical stance and what we're saying and and how our Christian values influence our ethics. So. There are a couple of additional things that I want to uh, throw out there for you. Um, first, we need to understand the power of language. Again, for better or for worse, and language has tremendous power, tremendous power, and we ought to wield it in a Christ-like way. You know, we ought to to be compassionate. We ought to, we ought to have all the fruits of the spirit. We ought to, you know, we ought to be gentle and kind and and, and forgiving and all of those things that, that Christ modeled for us should be a part of our communication as well. We ought to understand the power of language, the, the impact that it can have. I mean, that old saying, sticks and stones can break my bones, but words can never harm me. What a load of crap, right? Of course, words can hurt you. They can hurt you very badly. So we need to understand the power of language and use it in a, uh, a Christ-like fashion. We need to listen well. Again, go back to active listening. Um, Christ spent, Jesus spent a lot of time listening. 
and, and you know, much less time talking. I mean, you can uh, compare the number of times that he spent in conversation with, with individuals where he was listening to what they had to say and, and taking that in, empathizing with them. Compare that to the number of times that we know that he spent, you know, preaching on the Mount or things like that. He spent a lot of time listening. He knew the impact and the power of listening. And, uh, and we ought to uh, view that as a model for us as well and listen well. We need to know our audience. We need to know who we're talking to. Um, we need to know what their, their, their stances on different things, their faith. And we need to respect that. Not that we need to, again, agree with it. Not that we can't uh, try and uh, persuade them and share our own uh, feelings and things, but we need to know our audience and how to approach those folks and, and how best we can, we can serve them um, as, you know, Francis of Assisi is, is credited with saying this, that but preach the gospel all, at all times, use words when necessary, um, indicating that we ought to, uh, to, to um, uh, display our faith in, in other ways as well. And so we need to know our audience. Is this an audience that's going to respond to, you know, us, us sharing uh, with them, our faith with them in that way? And it doesn't always have to be about our faith, but, uh, but, uh, in, in a verbal sense, or is this an audience that's going to respond more to just seeing us live Christ-like lives and, and modeling that as best we can? Um, so we need to know our audience and, and what they're going to respond to in that way. And we need to understand then, too, that all messages inherently involve our faith. All messages inherently involve our faith. Um, when somebody knows that we are a Christian, or, or at some point when they find out we're a Christian, um, then they're going to filter everything through that. And everything's going to be about Okay, this is how what did the Christian person do in this situation? Whether you're talking about something for work and, and it has nothing to do with your faith, or whether you're, you know, whatever you're doing, you're just grocery shopping, every message we send then is going to be uh, viewed through that lens of our faith. So all of our messages involve our, our faith, and we need to keep that in mind as, as communicators. Right? As communicators, we need to understand that we are representatives. We are ambassadors for Christ. We are a representative of of what God has done for us and through us and, and continues to do in us. And, and so every message that we communicate is going to be uh, attached to that and have that attached to it. So all messages inherently involve our faith and we ought to take them seriously as a result. We ought to take it seriously. We ought to take ethics in communication seriously and, and take the notion that we are uh, ambassadors for Christ and that we are, uh, you know, walking, talking uh, billboards for the, the, for God's salvation. We have to take that very seriously in the way that we communicate. So essentially what I want to leave you with is that everything we do has the potential to plant a seed. Right? Every, everything, every message that we communicate is essentially a seed, whether we're communicating it verbally by speaking it, whether we're communicating it again, just through our behaviors, through our nonverbal expressions, through the, the way our, we keep our house and the way that we, you know, any of that kind of, uh, we communicate through so many different channels and in so many different ways, but all of it plants a seed in others about who we are about our character, about what that says about our faith. And so what kind of seed are we going to plant? Are we going to be planting seeds of faith and hope and salvation through the way that we communicate? Again, whether we're specifically communicating and explicitly communicating about our faith or not, are we planting a seed that, uh, that, that really displays the, the hope in the salvation that we have? Or are we planting seeds that really indicate that, you know, we're planting you know, weeds, basically, uh, and, and junk flowers, dandelions, and, and things that people don't really want in their yard? Uh, are we planting those kinds of th seeds and, and, and allowing those to grow in others in the way that we communicate? So we need to, to, to have in our mind these ethics, and especially these the Christian values, how they affect our ethics as communicators, and keep in mind that, that we, those are always on display for us as communicators and as, as Christians. If you have questions about, about ethical communication or about, uh, you know, specifically about the, the way that uh, Christian values influence and impact those ethics, please feel free to shoot me an email. I'd love to hear from you and discuss this a bit further and, uh, and discuss how all of this relates more into, to, you know, our, our 
the way that we use and, and, uh, and incorporate media communication into our lives. So um, we'd just love to, to hear any questions, comments, concerns that you have. Feel free to shoot me an email and I'll get back to you as soon as I can. In the meantime, I hope that you will give, again, strong consideration to what your methods and, and your messages of communication say about you and how those are impacting your ability to be seen as an ethical communicator.